With everything that a person does, there is the pa'ula and there is the tachlis. There is the act, and then there is the outcome of the act. For the act to be a rational act, it has to be that the anticipated outcome is worth more than the act, but the tachlis is more than the pa'ula. Lamashal. Someone has a store for his parnasa, and the store cost him X amount of dollars to keep up, to secure, to purchase merchandise, record keeping, that's the pa'ula. Obviously, he anticipates that the reward, the income, is going to be more than that. He may not have a guarantee. No one does. But at least I'll be fashion that has to make sense that there is a chance he's going to make more than he puts in, or else what he's doing is futile. It makes no sense whatsoever. If I go through all the difficulties of moving, of buying a new house, of transplanting my family into a new neighborhood, tremendous amount of agnus nefesh and difficulties and readjust. Obviously, my feeling is that the, if a family undertakes the task, that the ultimate outcome, the new setting, is going to outweigh the frustrations, expenses, and difficulties going about to attain it. If a tremendous palace is built for the king, the likings of which was never ever set on any foundation on this earth, that's the pu'ula. So the tachlis must be greater. The tachlis is that the kisei amelik, the heavenly throne and his crown and his honor, is going to be based in this palace, and the decisions of the king and the rule of the king are going to emanate from here. So a person has to understand on his own that the tachlis, the purpose, must be greater than the pu'ula, or else the pu'ula was not necessary. And what is the tachlis of the world? The tachlis of the Bria is the Torah. In Lagarisi Yoyma Valayla Chukka Shemayim the Arts Loisamti. The Rashes Baralakim, the Shola Tarish Nikri Rashes, like the Pasuk of Hashem Kanani Rashes Baka. That is made very clear. So how sad is it, says the Chavat Chaim, that you have a person that says, My son should stay in Yeshiva. What's the Tachlis? What's the Tachlis? This is the Tachlis of the world. This is the Tachlis of all Tachlis. I mean, they're looking at the world upside down. The Divine Shalom says that heaven and earth and everything that relates to it is the Pu'ula and the Tachlis is the Taira, the hidden light, the Taiv. The only thing that's ultimately going to last forever. Everything else is just a testing ground for how much are, for how much light, for how much Ganadin. Don't fall into the trap of the Chavot Chaim of turning the Seder around so that the Taira becomes sort of a Pu'ula. Yeah, in addition to having a nice quote, Tachlis, end quote, it's a nice thing to know how to learn a little bit. The purpose of Pasha's Bereshis is really to set our Amunah straight. The Chavot Chaim would often say that if someone feels that he is thrashless in Yonah Amunah, let him learn the Sipuri Atayr of Sefer Bereshis. And he himself used to spend time with the great Chavot Chaim who wrote the Mishnah Bruna. The venerable sage of Kral Yisrael would sit down with the Chumish after Tzilah Shachas every day and read from Sefer Bereshit. In other words, Mechavit Chaim is telling us, don't go into debate, don't try to become a philosopher, don't try to analyze, read the Pesukim. Read the Pesukim of Bereshit. Bereshit bara lekim shemayim varetz. Read what Hashem created on the first day, read what He created on the second day, read what He created on the third day, read Sheshit Sime Bereshit, again and again and again. And if you have to, read it every single day. And you'll see, the Yamuna that is in your heart will surface. And given that the Yerachayim HaKadosh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu really only created the world for six days anyhow, and it's only each Shabbos that gives the world a Kayach to last for another six days. So reading from Sefer Bereshit is reading a very current thing. It's what's giving the world the existence right now, the cycle of the world. The Sheshit and Eberashit and the Shabbat, which gives it the Kayach for another six days, is the, is the nucleus of our existence. So as a result, reading Sefer Eberashit on any given week relates to you as a Yid. Hashem created this world, a world of Nisyanites, a world of tests, a world of ups and downs, a world of unsettling times and tranquil times. And the Rabbanishim keeps creating it. And we 
as human beings, we as Yidin have a special affairs to adapt ourselves to whatever circumstances we are in and to rise to the challenge. So reading Bereshit is saying, this is the world that Hashem created for me. This Sunday, this Monday, this Tuesday, this Wednesday, this Thursday, this Friday, this week, and ultimately, how do I prepare myself for the Shabbos that's going to give me existence for another week? Each day is a test. Each day is a challenge. Each day is my Sibiratius, is a world that was created, is a setting that I was put into to deal with those as young men. My Sibiratius is not like building a house where the builder can be long gone and the house still stands, hopefully. My Sibiratius, this explains in Ephesus Chaim, is a continuous act. When the Rebbe gave the command for something to exist, that command continues to repeat itself again and again and again, giving existence to that item. So the Baruch was continuously recreating us every second of the day. Again, Dr. Chavot Chaim says, you feel your face is weak, your amuna is sagging, say the psukim, say the psukim. Don't argue, don't get depressed about it, reach in and draw it out. But Yoyim Elokim Yehi Ar, the lack of it should say. If the Yid finds himself in darkness, you're depressed, you're lost, you can't seem to sort things out, you're not even sure what to hope for, stop right there. The Vayner Shalala, I beg of you, have Rechman upon me. Don't leave me in this darkness. Enlighten my eyes and my heart. Let me see what you want me to do. Give me Simcha. Vayoyim Say, Hashem, I beg of you, Yehi Ar. Let me understand. Let me feel your presence. Don't take my belief in you away from me. And if you say that long enough and sincerely enough, you he are, then you'll feel the light. The Rabbanu Shalom will enlighten your heart. And don't feel because there are blind spots. Don't feel because there are times that you feel sort of lost. That's the sin that the Kaddish is sort of throwing you away. Dr. Kavrina Vahiyarev Vahivaykar Yoimecha. Vahiyarev is the evening, is the faith, the amuna that you sometimes have to fight for without any feeling of time. Then Nafcha Balaylas. Vahivaykar is the morning, is the R, is the Hasag, is the light, is the Simcha. These are all Yoimecha. One doesn't work without the other. That's the whole point of being down here. Dr. Chavachayim, a room can be very dark. You can't chase away the darkness with sticks and stones and tanks and even cruise missile it's all useless the room will still be dark but one candle one little flame will light up the room a person feels that he's overwhelmed with darkness he doesn't see the end to his problems what's going to be he's desperate he's about to lose hope all it takes is one little light of a moon and suddenly all of the thousands of pros and cons of whether he should worry or he should not worry, all of that becomes so completely irrelevant. He has seen the light. He has the Yamuna, he has the Simcha, he has the Betachi to go on, and that is what we're asking for. That's what we're asking for when we say, Hashem, please, let us feel from the light. The Arhagonis that is hidden in the Torah. The Chavot Chaim told us, Tanid, that the M is of Pihalach. When Hagba is done on the beam, and even though technically speaking, if the bima is built up and there is a gate around it, so the bima is a reshuf b'sneiatzma, and al piyalocha, you may not be obligated to stand up because you're not technically in the same room as the seifetayr. But if someone would feel how many worlds are turning, zelten kaikalimzich, the whole world, the light of the whole world, every aspect of every human being is there in the tayr. How could you not stand up for that? The word voracious itself includes, encompasses the entire Torah. The Vilna Gaon said that all of the Tariq Mitzvahs, all of the Halachas, and the specifics of the Halachas can be derived from the word voracious. And many Tzadikim are known to have said that the entire Torah is a pirish on the words of voracious Bar Alakim, which is the site of a moon in our heart. Not only that, but the Gra said, that every event that will take place in this world, that did take place, that is taking place, is the room is in the word Beresh. And when this drush of the grub was once told over to one of the maskilim of the time, he laughed. And he said, ask the grub, 
with the story of Yashkiz and the word Bereshith. When they told the girl what he said, the girl fired back that Bereshith is Rashi Tevis, Barasi Rasha, Shmai, Yeshai, Toloi. In the Sefer Agra the Kala from the Bnei Yisafcha, there are 194 Tarashas, each based on a different Rashi Tevis of the word Bereshith. Here are some of them. And of course, we can't go through all 194, but basically the Bnei Yisafcha shows what the Gros says, that all the Yisaitis of Yiddishkeit are Merunas in the word Bereshith. For example, what did Hillel tell the Ger? What's the Yisait of Yiddishkeit? The Ahafel or Yachel Kamecha? Bereshith is Rashi Tevah. De Mitzvah, Ahava, Reyecha, Yuchlau, Toira, Shleim. In the Mitzvah of loving your friend, the entire Torah is included. You have the letters Beis, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yud, Saf, unscrambled, but the letters Beresh. Many times we've discussed that the Torah has approximately 600,000 letters and it was given to the 600,000 original Neshamites that were Meqabal the Torah and each and every one of us are embedded into one of those 600,000 Neshamites and we each have a Chalik in the Torah. Beresh, says the Akrit Akal is Rashi Tevis. Bishvil, Shishim, Rebai, Oisius, Torah, Yisrael. The 600,000 letters that correspond to the Shamis of Kuala Yisrael. Answering Amon Yehesh Meirava, the Kuala with Kavana brings the moon into the heart of the Yid. It brings the belief of Bereshus Baral Akim into the heart of the Yid. Bereshus is Rashi Teva, says the Agud the Kuala. Beis, Reish, Alushin, Yud, Sof, Unscrambled. Ame, Yehesh Meirava, Tana, the Kuala. Answer Amon Yehesh Meirava aloud. The Gemara says that a person sees that he's surim boyim all of he's afflicted by pain. Ifashvish b'maisav. He should make a chesed on effort. Try to figure out why is this happening to you. Bereshis. Rashi Tevis. Ra'isa. Adam. Sheh. Boyim. Yisurim. Tifashvish b'maisav. The letter is Bereshis. And if you can't figure out why, base it on bitl Torah. Dwells into Torah then. So that your pain should be removed. Bereshis. is Rashi Tevis. If you see after you looked into it and you can't figure out why, Yitla de Bittel Torah. Again, the letters Beis, Reish, Aus, Shin Yudzav. There are 194 of these. The Bnei Yisavcha in the Agra the Kala goes through all of the Yom Tayzer. Eddie Remus and many of the specifics, even the Menhagim of the Yom Tayzer. Like the week of Tisha you don't eat meat or you don't drink wine. Rashi Tevah. Shvuas, Tisha of, Rachak, Basar Yayin, the letters Bereshit. When do we start reading Bereshit? In Eretz Yisrael, Shmini Atzeret. That's the simple thing when we start reading Bereshit. Bereshit, Rashi Tevis. Shmini, Bechag, Osif. Then, Yashilu, Reshit Tevis. That's when we start reading Bereshit. Saying Tilim, on Rashi Tishel. Gracious, Rashi Tevis, Yoimru, Tehillim, De, Chaydesh, El, Ritsuyim, Shvachov, that's when the Baruch Hu listens to our praises. Blowing Shoifer on Rosh Chaydesh El. Gracious, Rashi Tevis, Tiku, Shoifer, De, Chaydesh, El, Yoimru, Redumim, it wakes up those that are sleeping. And it just goes from Yomtiv to Yomtiv. Everything is included in the word Gracious. But even that an Anish of Yisrael does not eat until he sits the Haseba, Seder night, Rashi Teva, Bereshis, Bilel, Aviv, Rosh, Shevi Yisrael, even the poor person of Klal Yisrael, Yisai, Tamid, has to recline before he eats. When do we get the Taira? Shuas, which was on Shabbos, Bereshis, Rashi Teva, Re'e, Elikim, Diyoyim, Shabbos, Yikabu Teirasi, again, the days, Reish, Alok, Shin Yudsaf, Unscramble, Fasting on Yom Kippur, Bereshit, Rashi Tevis, Ritzei, Elikim, She Yisanu, Bonov, Yud, Tishrei, Bereshit, those that committed themselves completely to Torah, their bodies were whole, even after their passing, Bereshit, Rashi Tevis, Al, Yishloit, Bahem, Shum, Teila, Rabbana, the greatest proof, Rabbeinu HaKadosh, came back in the form of his guf to make Kiddush for his wife every Friday night. Bereshith, Rashi Tevis, Eshef, 
Rebbe, the wife of Rebbe, who witnessed her husband come back and make a kiddush every Friday night. And incidentally, just like Tayyar Shabbat starts with Bereshah's Borali Kim, which is a moon in the Divine Shalom, that's why we have to be in the spowl for this week. Tayyar Shabbat starts with me in the side, Kareem and Shema, the Ardis. Yaakov Avinu was the Sakin Philos Ardis. The Vainu Akadish was the Nitzvah of Yaakov Avinu, the Chida says. And therefore he begins Torah Shabbat with the Mitzvah of Kriyashma, the Mitzvah of Amuna, the Kriyashma of night, the Kriyashma of Amuna, the Kriyashma of believing in Hashem during difficult times and acting the right way and acting like a year does even when the going is tough, which leads to the Kriyashma Shal Shachris is the same as the beginning of Bereshus, where we have the Vahiyara, Vahivoyker, it's, it's all one thing. And perhaps the most practical lesson comes from the Lech of the Shem. It's brought down in the Sefer Torah Zavos. What does the Kaddish Baruch Hu want from us? Try. Begin. Decide in your mind, from now on I'm going to commit whatever time I have to learn, to learn with my children, to do chesed. Start. From now on I'm going to really have in mind every word of davening. I'm going to be mak, but I'm maestro money. Everyone knows what their Nesoyen is. But I'm never going to be able to hold out. What's the point of starting? Zach, the Rabbi Nishalaylam beracious Baralakim. The Rabbi Nishalaylam created this world for starters. The Chayz of the Yid is to try. You start L'Shem Shemayim. And if you start L'Shem Shemayim, the Kaddish Baruch Hu will help you. Beracious. It's for the starters. It's for the people that say, okay, I want to start now. Don't be discouraged. It's for you that Baralakim as a Shemayim Asar that Hashem created heaven and earth. Because once a year, sincerely shows that effort that he wants to start, Hashem will pick it up from there. Then it goes easy from there on in. A man came to the Kutzka Rebbe once and he said that he saw a table that belonged to the Baal Shem Tov. And he told him which found it, showed it to him. The Kutzka Rebbe said, here, come, let me show you what the Rebbe Rebbe showed me. He took him outside. The man saw nothing. I don't see anything, he said to the Rebbe. And the Kutzka told him that's the problem. He pointed up to the sky and said, Look what the Rebbe Rebbe showed me. A heaven that the Rabbi Nishalaylam created. Su'u mora minechem u'u mi bara eila. That's really what Pashas Bereshus is all about. To be able to look at the sky, not just to see clouds, but to see that the Rabbi Nishalaylam created it. And with that amun in our hearts, suddenly, we can feel the sunshine, even through the darkest of rain clouds. The Gemara says in Baba Basra that Adam Harishain's ankles, after he died, shined like two great suns. Now what exactly this means, that his ankles would shine like the sun in the sky, has to be understood. But clearly, Rav Dessler explains that the Gemara is conveying a message to us. And that is, don't underestimate Adam Harishain. Even the Chalik even the lowest part of his gulf, the ankle, after his tetira, after he passed away, still had so much kidusha that it could outshine the sun. And again, without even truly understanding what this means, but just look at the message. If those were Adam Harishan's ankles, then what was the light compared to an Adam Harishan's head? And if this was Adam Harishan Li'achar Maizai, and what can we compare the light of Adam Harisha in Bechaya? And Kavachayim will then deny Shal Kavachayim Rebbechaya during his lifetime before the Chet Eitz Hadas. The Gemara also says that Adam Harisha was min ha'aretz ad l'rakia, from the ground until the heavens, or misoy fo'olam v'yad soy fo'yhaya. And he was from one part of the world until the end of the world. That's the Gemara in Masech, it's Chagig, Adaf Yud Beis. And again, with these Agadah the Gemara, it's hard to understand exactly what it means. But the message that is being conveyed to us, as Rav Dessler explains it, is that Adam Arishayim encompassed the entire Berea, the entire creation and all of humanity that was to follow. That is also brought down in the Sefer Atanya. All the Nishamas, all future Nishamas were part of Adam Arishayim. He says those who were part of Adam Arishayim's head, they would be the future leaders of the generations, respective generations, and so on and so on throughout the Tzura of Adam Harishai. Now all of this, 
mandates to us the need to understand what the Chet Eitzadas was all about. The Torah doesn't just tell us Chatoim, different sins of people, unless the purpose is that we learn from this and understand a Mahalach in our own of Eitzad Hashem. Albeit the result says we will never truly understand what the Chet Eitzadas was really all about. It is a Soid Omuk. However, there has to be a simpler message that we can apply to our everyday life over here, besides the obvious, that the Torah wants to teach us with the Chet Eitzadas, with the first Chet that would change the destiny of the world. So we'll touch, we'll brush on the tip of the iceberg, as explained by the Zesler Zuchayim Levrach in the Sefer Nicht of Milio. Chazal say that the Yetzirah only entered Adam Rishon after he ate from the Yetzirah. It is only then that he knew being Toiv Lera. And this is also alluded to by the Ramban in Perik Bey's Pasuk Test, that there were the fruits of the tree that was moiled in Adam Rishon, a Ratzon, a Shuka, Taiva, temptations and lust, which in turn mankind is going to have to battle from here on in. But this leads us with a fundamental question. If Adam Arishan had not eaten from the Yetzirah, are we to presume that there would not be a Yetzirah? If so, what then is the purpose of creation? Didn't the Rabbani Shalom only create the human being so that he should have a prira, a free choice of being good or bad? Had things gone according to plan, had Adam Arishan not eaten from the Yetzirah, according to what we're saying now, he wouldn't have had a Yetzirah. So, there was no clear. No one would sin if he didn't have a Yetzirah. So the Nifta Milio quotes the Nefesh HaChayim in Sharal of Perig Vav, that indeed there was a clear even before the Chet Yetzirah. And the ability to sin was there prior to Chet. But there's a major distinction between the Yetzirah before the Chet Yetzirah and the Yetzirah after the Chet Yetzirah. The Yetzirah before the Chet Yetzirah was a separate entity. The person himself is Molei Kiddush, from head to toe. Still, the person has an option to sin. The person can enter into a domain of Tuma and fall into the clutches of sin. But he would have to enter into the domain of the Yetzirah in order to sin. After the Chet Yetzirah, it's a different story. The Yetzirah is no longer an external factor, but the Yetzirah becomes an intrinsic part of the essence of the human being. When a person is driven to hate, it is not an outside influence that is suggesting, try this, you're going to like it, but it is a burning desire within him that inflames his entire guf, pushing him to hate. That happened after the Chet Yetzirah. Before the Yetzirah, the Nachash, the Yetzirah, had to address Chava, had to address mankind from the outside, not from the inside. By eating from the Yetzirah, he now burns from the inside. And as we all know, when there's an inside man, it's a whole different story. And Rav Dessler illustrates what Rav Chaim Olajana says in a very beautiful way. When a person wants something, something that is prohibited, something that is not right, what does he say? I want it. I am tempted to it. But he has a conscience. The Yetzirah says, but it's not right. You are obligated to hold yourself back. It is also, you have to rise above it. Ultimately, your schar will be much greater than whatever temptation, whatever pleasure you're going to derive from these couple of minutes. And we have to work with the Yetzirah and say, rise above your desire. The schar for the mitzvah will be forever. The schar for the Yetzirah will be so short-lived. Now, listen to the conversation. I want. I want to have it. If only I could have it. No, it's not right. Please don't do it. Who's the abstract and who's internal? The Yetzirah is burning from within. The Yetzirah is working from the outside. That's what happened by the Yetzirah. If not for the Yetzirah, then yes, we could sin. Even Malachim sometimes sin. But it's a different type of sin. Most of those types of sins were miscalculations, were mistakes, were perhaps out of curiosity to step into something, into a different domain and to see what it's like. But it wasn't a burning desire from within. The Gemara tells us about Rav Amram Hasidah, who was successful in saving Jewish girls from captivity. 
and he put them up in an attic, and he kept them there overnight where they would be safe until he would find a place for them to go in the morning. During the night, the Yetzirah began to burn from within, like all Yetzirahs do. And although they were in an attic, by design, where he had no access to the attic, he lifted a ladder, which he said under normal circumstances he would have never been able to lift. But now the adrenaline was there, the Sahara was burning full steam, and he started to go up this ladder to approach them and perhaps engage them in a there. As he was going up the ladder and he felt the Sahara driving him, he turned toward the street and he began to yell, there's a fire! There's a fire! And all the Talmudim and everyone came running. And the girls came to the window to see what was doing. So two things happened over here. Number one, and this was his objective, obviously, there was no opportunity anymore for hate. Number two, the Amram had embarrassed himself. Because there was no fire. And here he was in the middle of the night, going up a ladder to the second floor. And everyone knew who was on the second floor. So the Talmudim said, Ready! Public relations, it doesn't look good. What did you do to us? And Rav Amram Chassidah answered, Mutavid is better. That a person should be a fool in the eyes of the world his entire life. Any embarrassment that I'm going to endure now is temporary, to say the least. A deal well done when I exchanged it for the possibility of embarrassment that would last forever after. And the Gemara says at that point, everyone witnessed a huge fire leaving from within Rav Amram, a fire that symbolized or tangibly was the Yetzirah that was made visible to all of the people there, and it left him. And when the people saw this tremendous fire leaving from within inside Rav Amram, they understood how powerful his Yetzirah was. The bigger a person is, the greater his Yetzirah is. And they knew what type of driver of Amram Chasida had to deal with. But he exercised an external trick to draw people from the outside in order to block the Yet Sahara that was driving from within him. Now once a person reaches the climax of his Messiah, one can be successful to reverse a Tadas, as Rav Amram Chasida was, for he drove the Yet Sahara out of him. And Chazal go on to say, the Moyudik and Madrega that he was zaycha to afterwards, a special shine that would come from him, and so on and so on. So that's the shine of other Marishai. That's the shine of Kiddusha that any person would have, that we had by Mat and Torah before the Chet Ego, if it weren't for the fact that the Yetzirah came back into us. And that is why there's an interesting phenomenon. We know that the Minhaga Yisrael, the Allah Chaisar, when a person leaves this world, he should be brought to Kura right away. Preferably that very same day. And also, the guf should be buried in the ground. Because the quicker the guf disintegrates, then the quicker the neshama can come to its tikkun, to its char and olam haba, to its complete char. Yet, we find kama the kama nicest by tzaddikim, that their bodies, for whatever reason, were exhumed or opened up, sometimes even centuries after their passing, and their bodies were whole. The Gemara tells us in the Sechus Bav Metziah, Rebbe Lezabre of Shinnin, after he died, was laying in the attic for years, and his body remained completely whole, except once a worm was crawling in his ear, and his wife got very worried, and he came to her in a dream and said, don't worry. That was only an onish, because they once heard a Tamachachim embarrassed, and I was not moich, I didn't protest. But it won't lead to anything. My body would not decay. There was a Yid in Square Town who was there when the Nazis dragged him and several others to the caver of the Rebbe of Melech. He told over the story. They were forced to open the caver. And the Rebbe of Melech, who had passed from this world almost 200 years prior to that, his body was whole. His skin was fresh. The Nazis were so frightened, they quickly ordered that the caver should be closed. And it's interesting, this Yid who said the story, he was one of those people that had to dig up and then cover the caver. He was Mr. and Chof al Ada, the Rebbe of Melech So how do we reconcile the requirement that the Guf should disintegrate so that the Neshama comes to its Tikkun, as opposed to canonizes by Tzadikim, by the Gra when he was moved, he had to be moved because of 
construction that threatened the Kiddush of the caver, they found his body to be whole. How do you reconcile this with so many stories of Tzadikim that indeed their guf was whole? And the Mepharshan explains that the reason the guf has to disintegrate for the Neshama to come to its tikkun is because Eitz Hadas created a Yetz Sahara that burns from within. So the guf has the Yetz Sahara. And in order for the Neshama to be completely free of the guf, so the guf has to wither away. And then the Neshama can truly be zaycha to its schar, to its reward in Olam Haba, to its true shine. However, if you have a tzaddik who during his lifetime reversed a tzaddik, like Rav Amram Chassidah, who stood up to the greatest Nesiyanis and destroyed the Yetzirah from within, like David HaMelech said, Li li cholal vikirdi, that is, Yetzirah would lie as a corpse from within him. So it was not necessary for the guf to disintegrate in order for the neshama to come to its tikkun. The guf is freed of the Yetzirah anyhow. Another difference that Chaim Belazhan explains between the Yetzirah before Yetzirah and the Yetzirah after Yetzirah is that before the Yetzirah it was a clear-cut situation. Good on one side, bad on the other side. And a person was either good or bad. After Yetzirah it's different. You have so many people lost in a world where they don't know what's good and what's bad. You have those that think that they're doing good and they're really doing the greatest of damage. And we have so many turning points in life, so many crossroads where we say to Bani Shalom, I want to do the right thing, but what is the right thing? And sometimes there is no clear-cut right thing because you have Toi the Ratnu Rabin Zebazer. And if that's the point out that the Rambam virtually says this to Savish in the Mayan of Aichim. The Rambam says that Adam Rishon before the Chait did not know Toi the Ra. He only knew that there is emes and sheker. Toiv is the rot from Hashem, this is the right thing. And there is ra, there is sheker, which is the wrong thing. After Eitzhadas, emes and sheker no longer were at the forefront. Rather, it was toiv the ra. In other words, there are two different drachim. Toiv, to be a good person, and ra, and I can engage in a world of temptation, a world of chait. But the world of chait now exists as an entity. You don't see it for what it really is. A meaningless tither that isn't really a tither that passes so fast and at the end it's not worth it. That was something other Mauritians saw before Chet Hetzadash. The choice was Emes and Shaker. Now it's no longer a choice of Emes and Shaker. It's Toivira. Both exist as tangible entities. And there is a danger of falling into the Shaker without knowing that it's Shaker. Thinking that it's a viable option to the tithe. But we're still left with one question. So why did Adam Arishan eat from the Yetzirah? Before he ate from the Yetzirah, he had no Yetzirah burning from within him. Before he ate from the Yetzirah, it was clear that there was Emes and Shekhar. So why did he do it then? And the vessel explains that Adam Arishan made a mistake. His mistake was not a mistake of taiva, not driven by desire, but his mistake was a miscalculation. Adam Arishan felt that now for me to be good, that's a Kiddush Hashem. That's the Tachlis of creation. Of course I'm good. I see over here the Emmet and all the reward. I see the Shekhar, how meaningless it is, and all the punishment. So obviously I'm good. I know no one's going to stop me to engage in Chait. But it's so obvious what the difference is. Adam Arishan felt that his abstaining from Chait under those circumstances hardly justifies the word Pchira. And as a result, it doesn't justify the reward. In order for there to be a true Kiddush Hashem, Adam Harishan rationalized or allowed for himself to accept the argument that if I take upon myself a new Yetzirah that is going to burn from within me, and I have that type of a desire and I'm going to fight it off, that would be a true Kiddush Hashem. And then I'll be zealous with too much greater and higher Madrigas fighting off a Yetzirah from within. Now, why was it a mistake? It was a mistake because although Adam Harisha intended well, the Rabbi Nishalaylam told you not to. And if the Ramchal, the Mashachayim, the Sato, explains it in the Daft of Unais, if Adam Harisha felt it would be a much greater Kiddush Hashem to bring the Yetzirah from within, and he holds himself back not to, 
he still doesn't do it because Hashem told him not to. In other words, I think it would be better this way to buy Shlom. I think the world would make much more sense this way, but I'm not going to do it because you told me not to. That within itself would have been mastering the greatest of Nisiyanis. And in as much as Adam Harishan's argument, what is the purpose of creation if there's no real Yetzirah, thinking that it would be better one way, and doing it another way, because the Rabbi Shalom said, do it this way, there can be no greater mastering of the Yetzirah than that. There can be no greater tasket of Bria Suwailah than when a Yid says, I think this way makes sense, but the Rabbi Shalom knows more than I do. And there is much more over here about the Ches Sadas which time doesn't allow us to dwell into in the Sefer Nech of Meliel, but he concludes with the following. Ultimately, what is our lesson over here? How many times in life do we say, let me just see what that's all about? Of course, I would have nothing to do with it. On the contrary, I want to see how to avoid it. And that's where the Yetzirah gets us. If we'll stop learning how to avoid things, just avoid it, then we're one step in the right direction of sending the Yetzirah back out. This Shabbos is called Shabbos Bereshit. The question is, how come next Shabbos isn't called Shabbos Noyach? Granted, the Zayra Kaddish says that every week is crowned with the Parsha. The Kedusha of the week is based on the Parsha of the week and so on. And whatever Hashpois are channeled through Parsha's Noyach come during the week of Noyach. But still, we don't refer to the Shabbos as Shabbos Noyach the way we refer to this upcoming Shabbos as Shabbos Bereshit. Dr. Shinnadarov, in the name of his father-in-law, the Arya de Be'olai. What happens during the month of El, during the Yom Yom Meirayim, Erev Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, when we're concerned, when we're worried about what our Pesach Din is going to be. So we do whatever he does during difficult times. We're makabal upon ourselves. We're bain Get me out of this problem, and I'm telling you, every Shemaynesre will be a crystal clear Shemaynesre. No more Chab Shlap. Every Tzil is going to be with the proper Hachana. No more setting the snooze on the alarm clock three times and waking up the last minute and falling into the base of Medrash with my tie half on and half off. I'm going to wake up before davening. I'm going to learn with my children. I'm going to have guests. I'm going to give tzedakah. I'm not going to get angry anymore. Everyone knows what field of improvement awaits for them, respectfully, to correct. And when we feel the pinch, when we need the Rach Meshemayim, we're all willing to accept anything upon ourselves. The problem is, once the heat is off, we have to remember what our Kabbalahs are, and once we got what we wanted, so we have power's problem. When the Mac is no longer there, you no longer feel the same drive to correct these problems. So Shabbos Bereshit is just a term. Hanach lehen liyisrael, imenu nevi and b'nei nevi imenu, that Kuala Yisrael set into place to remind us, okay, the days of Elul passed, Rosh Hashanah passed, the Yisrael, you made Shuvah passed, Yom Kippur passed, you got through Yom Tiv, you don't know how you paid your bills, but somehow you managed to push through, you were macabre upon yourself many things, you said to yourself, this year is going to be different. No, until now you didn't have any time. But now, now that the year has been set into motion, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu is reminding us, okay, it's the beginning of the year. All resolutions, all commitments, it's all over. Now it's for real. Are you different? Is this the beginning of a new year and a new life? Is this going to be the year you're really going to spend time with your children? Is this going to be the year you're really going to control your temper? Is this going to be the year you're really going to control your time? Or whatever a person's specific Nisayan is. It's Shabbos Bereshit. The Yom Neram are over. Now we're going to see how it applies itself to you. Even when a person is well-intended, and indeed he wants to apply his new resolution, there's a danger here as well. When a person has dynamic aspirations in mind, especially at the beginning of a new year, and he now wants to test them, one has to really take a thorough look into oneself to know exactly who is leading the charge. And perhaps we can understand this of the most fascinating Medrash Rabbah that's brought down in the Sefer Bear Moshe from the years of Rebbe Chaim Levracha. The Medrash Rabbah says, what was the argument between Cain and Hevel in addition to the other Inyanim that Chazal bring down? 
the lack of kind of carbon being accepted, the extra sister, and so on. But the Medrash says, this was their argument. Their only one of them said, Bitchumi, in my boundary, they said, Mikdash Nivna, the Vesemidash was going to be built. The Zayma and the other said, Bitchumi, they said, Mikdash Nivna. No, it's going to be built in my boundaries. How do we know this is what they were arguing about? Because the Pasik says, the Yayma Kain of Hevel Achiv, by Yehidi Yaisam Basada, when they were out in the field. The Ain Sada Ela Vesemidash, says the Medrash. And as a result of this argument, in other words, the measure says, in all due respect to the other disagreements that they had, but what was the final mark of the passage? What was the straw that broke the camel's back? In the heat of their argument, what was the point of the dispute over here that Cain finally snapped and killed his brother? This argument over in whose territory the base of Migdash is going to be built, because that's what the passage says. The Yitz and the Sada is the base of Migdash, says the Medrash. And that was it. Cain had enough. By Yochum, Cain will have a lochid. By Yargayim, you say that the is going to be in your chalik. I'm going to kill you. As I was telling us over here, explains the Vermeisha how dangerous the most dynamic, even spiritual aspirations can be if they aren't cleansed. If the person is really just thinking about boosting his own personal prestige. And he cloaks it in L'Shem Shemayim. This kind of arm wrestling into the Mizrachat, because after all, I'm the one who can accomplish, this can be potentially the most devastating thing. But Pasek wants to make it very clear. This caused the world's first murder, where one brother murdered another brother. We all know the famous story of the Bachar who had a hard time getting married, because... He had alumalis. His mother told him so. He was handsome. He was tall. He knew how to learn. He was a masmid. He davened gishmak. He had a great sense of humor, a wonderful personality, charisma. So finally the Rav told him, but you have one major fault. You are very, very conceited. The way you walk on the street, the way you dismiss people that you don't want to talk to, don't think you're perfect. So the Bachar took him a Sol Kisharim, and he took an Archa Sadiqim, and he worked and worked and worked real hard. And his whole demeanor changed. He walked on the street, much more bent over. He seemed that he was being Machnia himself, and the Rav was so happy. So he called him in, he started reading him the previous Shidduchim that he had turned down, that he wouldn't hear of, because that family wasn't enough of a Meyuchus, that family wasn't rich enough. And the Bachar said, I don't understand you. Randy... Before I didn't have all the miles, I had this one problem. I was a Balgai, even though Shidduchim weren't good enough for me. Now that I'm even the biggest honor in town, you ready? Need these Shidduchim? For sure now I need something better. We all make this mistake. And the Pasuk makes it very clear. Kayan made this mistake. Kayan did not realize the irony of his own mixed up emotions. Yes, Hevel was Ahov Lesmeha Makai. Hevel was Mamsha Hashroa Sashchina on himself. And that's why Hevel was a Rawi that the Beis Amigda should be built in his home. Not only that, the Ber Moshe explains, because Hevel himself was an Onav and he was Machnia himself. He was Dainat to the Beis Amigda. He was Mashra the Shchina on himself and on the entire Bria. Like the Mechilta says, Kal Mishri Onav, Marsti itself does it. Soifay Lahashra Shchina. In the Adam Ba'aret. So this was the irony. This was the vicious cycle over here. The more Cain saw that Hevel was like to Ashra Sashrina, that the Kedusha shined from him, that fires were coming down from Shemayim, that obviously he had a window to heaven that was open, the more angrier he got, and the more angrier he got, the more abrasive he got, the more conceited he got, the more vicious and temperamental he got, he kept digging himself deeper and deeper into the pit. The less he was Zeichet to Ashra Sashchina, the more Hevel was Zeichet to. The Ben Maish explains Hevel's occupation of being a shepherd was diamond to the others being shepherds. He was Zeichet to their Madrigas of Nevu and Kedusha. And the Ben Maish says, I'm married to Taich in the Pasuk. A very simple, but such a powerful Taich. The Kaddish Baruch Hu asked Hevel, where is Cain? And we all know what was Cain's answer. Shoy Merachi, you know, I'm my brother's keeper. 
That sounds like a very rude answer. It's not the kind of answer you would say to anyone you respect, never mind a king, and never mind the Melech Malchi and Lachim HaKadosh Baruch So the Bar Moshe says, there's another touch over here to the word Shaimer. Shaimer means a guard, someone who watches over something. In Hilchah's Peiris, especially in regard to the Elochis of Tuma and Tahara, there is the Peiris itself, the fruit proper, and there's something called a Shaimer to a Peiris. The shell, inner shell, the outer shell, elements of the peri that guard the peri. And there's a question whether that shimer has the same din of the peri itself. So a Kaddish Baruch will ask Kayan, what did you do? Where's Havel? And Kayan's response was, did you see how this relationship was going? Am I supposed to be a shimer for my brother? Is my whole existence of this world only to maintain my brother? Only to guard over him? Only to keep him? I wasn't willing to take that from him. I wasn't willing to deal with that kind of a relationship. And therefore, I destroyed him. And little did he realize that the Kedusha that had emanated from Hevel came as a result of Hevel's Hachna. And if Cain was willing to be the Shaina, then he too would have been Zeichot to those Madre guys. The very element of his anger was his undoing. And that's the Kedusha who told him the Pesach. Pesach, if you give a Pesach for the Yetzirah and you allow the thoughts in your mind me, me I should subjugate myself to someone else I should ask the Rosh Hashiva or a Mishgiach or a Dayan or a Rebbe what to do I'm smarter than him once you allow those thoughts in you should know you're driving yourself further and further away from a Shras Hashkina Le Pesach, if you open the door to the Yetzirah Chathas Rosh then you're going to be crushed by the hate. You're going to sink into the hate. The hate will lay before you and mislead you and trip you. And you're going to try to run away from it, not realizing that you're running into it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu told Kayan, Nod Nod, Tia Ba'aret, you're going to wander around now to pay for the crime of your murder. Take a look at the word Nod the Nod. You're wandering. They're spelled Nun, Ayin, Nun, Dalit. It has almost all the letters of Gan Eden, except for the Gimel. Gan Eden has the Nun, the Ayin, the Dalit, and the Nun. The words Nor the Nun have the Nun, the Ayin, the Dalit, and the Nun. So just the extra Gimel in Gan Eden. What is the Remus over here? Kayan. Kain, look what you did to your life. You're going to wander around nowhere. No security. Lack of a home, lack of any basis in your life. Always wondering whether the people are applauding loud enough behind you and what they're saying. And you could have had, for the very same effort, Gan Eden, the same letters except you were missing the Gimel. What does the Gimel of the Gan represent? It represents what the Gemara tells us in the Sechs of Shabbos. If your attitude had not been one of such arrogance, but you would have looked to help, you would have looked to somehow provide a gemilah chesed in whatever way you can, help the one brother you had in the world, then you would have been Ganeid and you would have had the security that you really wanted, you really craved, which was the very reason you were getting angry through acts of chesed, through dzeikus and ischabos with tamid nechachamim, especially when you put your own honor aside and you're willing to join and become part of someone else, that is the greatest key to be zeichet to ganeitin. Those who support tamid nechachamim are zeichet the yeshiv, the yeshiva shalmaila, and look what you did. Look what you did. You took these very letters, and because it was missing that all-important gimel, you turned ganeitin, ultimate peace, tranquility and security, the shine of the Shekhinah, the greatest definition of happiness which is even beyond our comprehension, you took that and you turned it into a life of lack of security, of fear, of wandering, of having no place, 180 degrees in the other direction. Even though the midst of Shatnes, not to mix wool and linen is a chok, we don't understand the reason, but the Medjish does tell us, Hevel bought the Karbanes, of sheep, wool comes from sheep, 
Cain bought the carbon of flax. The results of these two carbonates head on, and the reflection were devastating. The Medrash Sanchuma says the Amar Hakadosh Baruch Hu ain't no din she yisari mincha sachoyta in mincha zakai. I don't want that a carbon of pureness, like Hevel's carbon, should get mixed up with flax. A yitch not even wear wool and linen mixed together. The Bermoisha quotes from the Rakanti b'shem amikubalim. Shatnes is the letter Satan Az, the power of the Satan, who comes and convinces us and confuses us and sends us off into the wrong direction. The Haloyve Shatnes does in Tfilosi, and one who wears Shatnes in his garments pushes away his own Tfilosi. His own prayers are not accepted. For the same reason that Kain's cousin is not accepted. Shatnes represents this first problem. Kayan. He looked for the Besamidish to be built in the Chalik, but for the wrong reason. He wanted so badly for his carbon to be accepted, but for the wrong reason. And therefore he missed the most basic element of carbon, to be Makriv himself, to be Machnia himself. Kayan brought his carbon, and the Pasuk says, the Hevel Hevi Gamhu, and Hevel also brought his. But the Lashen is the Hevel Hevi Gamhu, he brought himself, he was ready to be Makriv himself. He was ready to do whatever was necessary for Kvayit Shemayim. Sometimes that meant sitting at the Mizrach wall, and sometimes it meant sitting at the Marav wall. As a matter of fact, Hebel's attitude was he was perfectly happy to follow along Kayin, if Kayin was going to lead them in the right direction. Therefore it says the Hebel Hevi Gamu, he said, okay, I'll be second in command. Let it be Kayin who brought the carbon, and me too, I also brought a carbon. Hebel was happy with that. If indeed that would bring about the Kvayt Shemayim, if that would establish his relationship with the Rabbi Nishalayim. The irony was, it was this very attitude that brought the Yeshua Tashkina on Hevel's carbon away from Cain. Misha Dati Shvela. One feeling of anivas, one feeling of, it doesn't make a difference what people say about me, as long as I'm doing the right thing. Ma'la olav ha'kasek ilu hikriv kala karbonis kulam, says the Gemara in sight. So the posse considers that as if this person was makriv, all the karbonis there are to be makriv. Agrifa Samelach brought a thousand karbonis on one day. A thousand on one day. And he had a dream at night and he was told, thank you very much, but you should know. One poor person came and he was makriv a karbon, and that is more chashev than shemayim. In all due respect to your karbonis. And this is the message that we have to be mispowered for when we begin Shabbos Bereshit. And we want to start a new year. And we all want to do the right things. So we've committed ourselves to do the right things. But we shouldn't fall into the trap of what's called doing the right thing. We shouldn't allow the Yetzirah to cause us to underestimate ourselves. We should say, What I can do, no one else in the world can do. And by the same token, we have to take a solo look within ourselves and say, but why do I want to do it? Why am I doing it? And where best am I going to apply my talent and effort to what is going to benefit those around me or to what is going to benefit my prestige? Hashem said to Kayin, Lama Charalach, Lama Naflu Tanach. Why are you so angry? Why are you so depressed? Because your cardinal wasn't accepted? So who are you angry at? Imitative. If you're going to do tshuva, if you're going to straighten out your life and want for what is really good, then it's the ace. It's going to be lifted up. You think that if you're going to be machni yourself to someone else's das, you're going to lose prestige. It's going to be exactly the opposite. That is what is going to make you great. There is the famous marshal of the Sefer Gesher Achayim about two twins that slowly were developing in their mother's womb. These two twins really were very fond of each other. I mean, they had some life. Imagine, from morning until night, 24 hours a day, floating, floating in liquid, breathing a special kind of breath, absorbing a special kind of food, a malach there, teaching them to tell you a special light burning for them. As these two twins were slowly growing and developing, it was Manish Gan Eden. And then one day, something very frightening happened. Terrible shouts, terrible screaming. 
And one of the twins seemed to be pressured or even worse, dragged out. The other twin, the remaining twin, began to cry. Oh no, he said. What happened to my brother? He's gone. In reality, his brother was born. But in the limited perception of these two twins, they misunderstood the beginning of life and the end of life. Because life suddenly changed and was different in terms of how they knew it, how they were able to see it, they didn't understand it. They thought it was all over. When actually, it was just beginning. In the Sechus Tzachim, you find a rather strange machloikis between the Chachmei Yisrael and the Chachmei Um Sa'ila. The Chachmei Yisrael say that during the day, the sun travels underneath the heaven. According to Rashi, that means it shines on the earth as we see it. We look up and we see the sun shining on us. At night, the sun travels above the heaven, and therefore it is not seen down here. That's the opinion of the Chachmei Yisrael. The Chachmei of Mithraim, on the other hand, seem to have a more conventional approach. They say that at night, the sun goes underneath the ground. In other words, on the other side of the planet. And Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi says, the near in Devrein, the Devrein would appear that they are right. And as proof, he cites the fact that underground sources of water tend to be colder during the day than they are at night. Why are they warmer at night? Because the sun is baking it on the other side. Rabbi Gideg in the Gilean Ashaf quotes the Yeshita Mechabatsis and the Sechus Ksubis and the Gimel on the Bay. And he says an interesting thing. Even though Chazal admitted that the Chachmi Yumasoyim are right, the sun goes around the world, however, that is only a Nitzachayim in the form of Tainas. But the Ennis is Kechachmi Yisrael. The Harayim, we say, during the evening, Vokeya Chaloyne Rekia, Kaddish Baruch Hu, splits open the windows of heaven, and the sun comes forth. So you see that at night, the sun disappears behind the heaven. So obviously this needs somewhat of an explanation. What does the Shita and the Kavetsis mean? Chazal admitted that the Chachmi and the Suwailam won the debate, and they're right, but the Emes is according to us. How can one person be right and the Emes be according to someone else? In the Sechus of Rosh Hashanah, and the Firalos on the Ralos, there was a Machlaki of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua, when the world was created. Rabbi Eliezer says, the Tishrei Nivra Ha'ilam, and Rabbi Yeshua says, the Nisan Nivra Ha'ilam. The Maskan of the Gemara, Lahalach, is that when it comes to measuring the Kufa Sachaman to determine when seasons begin, we bask in according to Rabbi Yeshua. So we bask in that the world was created during the month of Nisan. Now, there's another Gemara in the Sechus Rosh Hashanah, where Rav Shmuel Yitzchak asks, according to whose opinion, according to what, do we say, Zehayah and Tchilas Nasecha, the currently I'm Rishon on Rosh Hashanah? And the Gemara responds to this, as if to say, what's the question? Why are you even asking? What do you mean, according to whose opinion? Obviously, it's the opinion of Rav Yoliezer. He is the one that says that the world was created during the month of Tishrei. Frek Taisis, but we pass on the Krib Yeshua that the world was created during the month of Nisan. When it comes to calculating the seasons, we base it on a Nisan creation. So why did the Gemara seem to respond in such a matter-of-fact way? Like, what's the question? Of course. We say during our Rosh Hashanah davening, today is the first day, because that goes according to Rabbi Eliezer. We don't pass him like Rabbi Eliezer. And for Tysonus, that in reality, both Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Eliezer are right. How do you explain that? How can they both be right? The answer is that the Tishrei was all of the Machshava to create the world. And during Nisan, it was actually created. It physically came into being. So, Saif Maise the Machshava Tchilo, every Maise is based on a Machshava, and as a result, even according to Rabbi Yeshua, who says, that beneath the Nivra Oilam, it is fair to say in Rosh Hashanah that today is the first day, because it was the first day of Machshav. But that's in terms of Tfil. In terms of Tfil, the very beginning is the thought process. However, when you have to calculate the seasons, you have to know 
How many revolutions of the sun? How many times did this take place? And when did the planet physically start spinning? That was Nisan. So over there we passed on the Yeshua. Rosh Hashanah in the Sefer in the end of Sheva has a beautiful explanation on this. We say in Rosh Hashanah, Hayim Haris Oila. Haris is a Lashon of Haraya, a Lashon of pregnancy. On Rosh Hashanah the process began of the world coming into being, but physically it did not exist until the later, until it was born through Nisa. Every fetus, after 40 days, is really complete in a certain way. On the other hand, it could not live as a human being. It can only exist in its own environment. In a sense, that is the Buyas Ha'olam of Tishrei. HaKadosh Baruch created the world. That is a Prima of Machshava. In concept, in idea, it exists. The whole human being is there. However, the Rabbi Yishlam said that the world doesn't come to its birth, the coil, it doesn't function and cannot function until Nisa. And perhaps we can explain this a little bit more. If someone took a fetus and he had the proper microscope, the proper scientific data, he would be able to determine by analyzing this fetus exactly, the color of the skin, the nature of the child's weight, millions of pieces of information about the metabolism of this particular individual. So a scientific analysis, a genetic report may determine, if you regard to a certain fetus, that this fetus is going to be six foot five. You and I may look at the fetus and see only a tiny fetus. We may look at two fetuses and say, what do you mean? The report says that this one is going to be 6 foot 5 and the other 4 11. It doesn't make any sense. And you're telling me that you see this? That it's a physical reality? We don't see that as a physical reality. We see two tiny babies. Yet, the essence of these children are very different. If you have the ability of seeing their structure, of seeing their genes, of seeing what exactly is in the planning stages of the year. So you have several disputes in Chazal between the Chachmi Yisrael and the Chachmi Yateva about exactly how planets turn, the stars, the Mazalais, and so on. And Chazal say one thing, and the Chachmi Yisrael say something else. And apparently they're pointing to it and they're saying, how could you disagree with us? Look at the Messias. Here, look through this telescope. And Chazal say, you're right. Dr. Shrita and the Kedah says, yes, Chazal say, you're right, but what we say is the Ennis. How do you reconcile this? You're looking at the physical reality. We are looking at the Olam HaMachshav. The Olam HaMachshav is Ennis. The physical reality is a limited view of a given item in its particular stage. For example, the scientist who looks at the fetus and analyzes the genes can determine exactly what this baby is going to physically look like when the baby is one month old, two months old, three months old, a year, two years, five years, ten years, adolescence, all the way through. You know we have this genetic map and we see exactly what kind of human being this person is going to be. So the scientist starts talking about how tall or how big, or how smart, or about certain physical handicaps, or maybe extra special talents or challenges that this child is going to have to endure or experience as a human being. You're going to look at this person and say, I don't see it. In the course of life, you may look at the child and say, oh, it's this kind of a child. You may look at this person as a young adult and say, oh, he has these features with these characteristics and so on. So you're looking at the Maisa, and the scientist, in this case, is looking at the Machshava. Maisa is only as good as what is taking place right now, but it's not the complete picture. In the Yolam HaMachshava, every single morning, the Kaddish Baruch Hu opens up the Daus of Shari Mizrach, Uvokeya Chalayne Rekiya, Umoisi Chaman and Makayma. 
Chazal saying, we are telling you what Briyas Olam is all about. And the scientists scream, but this is what we see. And Chazal say, you're right, we agree this is what you see. But we understand more. Now, if you have to measure a person's height to know whether he's going to fit to the door, then you have to look at the Messias of who that person is right here and now. But in terms of the essence of the person, if we can go deeper than that and say, who is this neshama, where does this neshama come from, what is this tafkin on the world? So there is a much greater picture. On we look at the greater picture. Zayyem chilas masecha. Factually speaking, when it comes to calculating something, we have to look at the reality. When did the world start spinning? And that's what Taisus means. Elu v'elu d'v'elu kemchai. The both of the Eliezer and the Yeshua are right. So Chazal tell us, or should Bar HaKadosh Baruch Hu be Yom Rishon, served only during the day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu thought they're going to be the Shoyim, who are going to use this special light of Ruch HaKadosh for the wrong thing, so HaKadosh Baruch Hu hid it for the Tzadikim Yosef Lover. It sounds like HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, okay, we're going to try it this way, uh-oh, it won't work, let me change it, let me hide it, let me take it away. But Chas HaShol, it's not safe to say such a thing, Kaviyach Lubar HaKadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu never took away that light. That light is hidden. The Zayr HaKadosh says, were it not hidden, were it completely taken away, the world would have no existence whatsoever. Where is it hidden? It is hidden in the Taira. And in the course of our lives, there are times that we are Zayr to feel that our HaGon is. The Lachavitch had an interesting touch on the Pasuk, as quoted in the Sefer, the Seed of Shalom from the Slanam of Rebbe Bracha. The Yemen of the Kimi he are, by he are. The Lach of Ishatites, by Yaimer. When a Yid, who feels that he is surrounded by darkness and he's confused, frustrated, worried. When a Yid says, by Yaimer, he says, I'm in this darkness. Please make it light for me. Let me see the light that I know is within me. The result has to be, by he are that a Kaddish Baruch Hu will make it shine for him. The other Ganas that is hidden in every single year is there and waiting to be brought out, to shine. But you have to first ask for it. A Kaddish Baruch Hu first created the world with the other Ganas. That is the fetus. The genetics of this world have an other Ganas in it. If not, there would be no Kiyam. Deep in the heart of every single year there is a real Amunah. There is a Crystal clear a muna in a kaddish baruch a cheshek a simcha a love a yahava for Torah and mitzvahs. It's there, but not everything you see in the genes do you see in the person. It's hidden. Sometimes it remains dormant. But if it's there, even if it's dormant, even if it's buried very, very deep, if you cry for it, vayoyimer when you say alikimi he are I need that light, and they he are, then you can be zayshet to it. Then it will be there for you. The Medish Tamchum and Pashas Nayak says that the Or HaGonis reveals itself for those who toil hard to understand Teresh HaBopeh. Ha'am HaHochem B'Chayshach Ra'u Or Gadol, the Navi Yishai says. That is the Or HaGonis that shines through in Teresh HaBopeh. So that is one way to attain the Or HaGonis. That is the Aveda of during the week. Yigiyah in Teresh HaBopeh. Sleeping less, eating less, putting the world aside a little bit and immersing oneself in Limur HaTayra. As Chazal tells us, Barasi Yitzhahar, yes, I have created the evil inclination, I have created the drive to do that. However, Barasi like Tayra Tavlin, Tayra is the antidote. Limur HaTayra brings out the Arhagonis even in someone who appears to be swept away by the Yitzhahar. However, it comes from another approach as well. The Zohar Kodesh says, that on Shabbos Kodesh there is a Hizgalus of the Ar Haganis, of the Ar Kadma, the original Ar of Sheshit and Meberashis, that is within the genes of this world and is really part of our very essence. On Shabbos Kodesh, a year is Zaycha to take the Arzias, to take the Gashmias of this world, and if he applies it properly, to turn that regular piece of Kogo into a vehicle of Ur Haganis, if he creates the right environment around it. As the Kabrina said, Kodesh he Lachem Shabbat HaMalka. Through Shabbat HaMalka, even the Lachem can become Kodesh. So we're dealing over with the same Ur Haganis, but two completely different approaches to it. 
There's the Avoida and the Yagi of Teresh Abopeh, where a person is Zaycha to the Aragon is through a Beto of Gashmias, through sleeping less and eating less, and then there is the Kedusha of Shabbos, where a person is Zaycha to the Aragon is by eating right and sleeping right. And it's not a steal where these two different approaches complement each other. And both are necessary in their proper time. Now the Svasenes sees a tremendous practical rule over here. And the Svasenes gives us the insight that if we understand it, it can really be the guiding light to get us through life. How many times does it happen that a person is halfway through davening and you know you didn't really daven? Who knows if he even said most of the words? Or Shabbos went through and you've overslept, you've overate, you know this is not what Chazal meant when they said she did the Shabbos time. Or half the year passed by and you say, that's it. From now on, may I to the Ad Olam, I am going to be an Erlich, I'm going to do things right. And two days later, it's business as usual. But then you say, that's it. From now on, I'm going to say every single word in Davidin, I'm going to give proper maestros, whatever the Indian is, what a person needs is Chizikim. And two days later, business as usual. But again, every once in a while you have this urge within you that says, that's it, I can. From now on I'm going to eat like a man, I'm going to dive like a man, I'm going to talk like a man, and from here on in. And then you say to yourself, but you've said this to yourself so many times, you're fooling yourself, what's the point? You know that these commitments are, are ear, they're plastic, they're not real. But a Bani Shalom is telling us, no. Look at me. Look at how I created the world. So the Bible says, to start with, the world can't exist with the R, with the light being open. The wicked are going to use it for the wrong things. They aren't worthy of this R of Ruach HaKadosh, where you feel the Ashwaz of Shreen and see it clearly. It has to be hidden. Yet a Baruch said, this is the way to do it. We're going to create a world full of R. You know it's not going to work. But that has to be your attitude. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew to start with is going to have to be hidden yet. This is how HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to think the same way. From now on, I'm going to be perfect. Ah, you've done this a thousand times, and you know you won't be able to maintain it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew that as well. But that's how you create a world. I would like to discuss a not-so-famous medrash that describes a very famous Chazal. We all know that the Pasuk says, Nasa Adam, come and let us make men. Reason being, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was Koveya, a meeting with the angels, and said, should we create men or not? The reason HaKadosh Baruch Hu did that wasn't because HaKadosh Baruch Hu needed the help of any Malachim or really needed their advice, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to teach humanity a lesson. Before you make a major decision in life, definitely before you create new things, seek counsel, ask advice. Now, let's listen to the message. When Moshe Rabbeinu wrote the Torah, and the Kodesh Baruch was telling Moshe Rabbeinu what to write, and they came to the Pasuk of Nasa Adam, Mitzal Meinu Kid Mefeinu, Kiva Shagil the Pasuk of Yemer Lekim Nasa Adam, Amal Ufano, so Moshe Rabbeinu said to the Kodesh Baruch Hu, the Baruch Hu, are you sure you want to write it this way? The Baruch Hu, Ma'at Anoisein Pichon Pelaminim, why are you giving a Pizchan Peh? Why are you giving an excuse to the Apikarsim to suggest that because the Pasuk says, Nasa Adam, come, let us make man, that Chas Shalom, there is an indication that there were two entities who created man. Why do this? Why write it this way? Let's make it very clear what the truth is, that there is only one HaKadosh Baruch who created man. Omalei HaKadosh Baruch Hu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Meish Rebbeinu, right as I told you, Right, Nasa Adam, come, let us make man. The Haroitza Litris Yit. And this is the part of the Medrash, which is not so famous, but it's quite powerful and needs explanation. HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Meshur Rabbeinu, if somebody wants to make the mistake of thinking that there were two entities who created man, let him make that mistake. But, you write as I tell you. And why does the Kaddish Baruch Hu want the Lashon to remain, Nasa Adam, come and let us make man? Suppose a person who is perceived to be greater in terms of his stature, his respect, says, I should seek counsel, I should take advice of those who are lesser than me. A husband should say, I have to ask my wife if she's masculine. A employer should say, I should ask my employees. 
A head of a family should say, I should discuss this with members of my family? The older brother should say, I should discuss this with my younger siblings? Doesn't pass. And it may have a neutralizing effect, a compromising effect on my ability to issue orders, to maintain my level of power as commander-in-chief, or whatever this person perceives himself to be. I mean, like, so we say to him, sir, excuse me, but why don't you learn from your creator? The Rosham created whatever is above and whatever is down below. Kivan Shabbat, Libra Yasa Adam, when he came to create man, Nimlach the Melach Yashai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kaviyachal, so to speak, took advice from the Melachim. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu can do that, don't you think you should as well? Freik Jebel Chana. This is brought down in the Sefer, Or of Chana Mechelik Beis Amad Chavchas. This requires a lot of explanation. How do we understand the Kaddish Baruch Hu's answer? Uh, let's be practical over here, or rational. By writing Nasa Adam, come let us make man, in the plural, there is something to gain and there is something to lose. Now, normally, when you have to make a decision, and you have something to gain or something to lose, so indeed you should take counsel as advised over here. And how is a rational body of people that are convened together going to make their decision? They're going to weigh the gain against the possible loss, and they're going to determine that the gain is so much that it is worth the loss, which perhaps is not that great. So if I told you, do this deal, you may earn a new customer and make $50,000 a year from it. But if it doesn't go right, you may get some of your other customers angry, and you'll wind up losing $20,000 a year. No. You can hear it. And even if I told you, do this deal, you can make $50,000. But if you lose, it's going to cost you 100000 Okay, so if someone has a, somewhat of a challenging spirit, and he doesn't need tranquilizers to sleep at night? No. Maybe. It's a rational gamble may not be for the feeble-hearted, so to speak, but there are people who take risks and chances. But suppose I told you like this. Do this, and if it works out, you'll get $10,000. If it doesn't work out, you will lose every single penny that you own, and you will never, ever have a chance to earn another cent. It's hardly likely that anyone that is within the Tchum Shabbos of rationale is going to give you the green light for this. So let's try to look at this, at the acknowledged pros and cons of writing Nasa Adam, and let's try to understand this. On the one hand, there's a very nice lesson over here. Nasa Adam, come let us make man. Seek counsel. Seek advice. Don't think you're too smart. And if you, by the way, don't happen to get this message across, then you may have people that are not going to believe in it by the Shalom. You may be mechazic, the words of Epi Carson. I mean, how can you possibly compare the gain to the loss. The gain is a nice lesson. The loss means losing the amount of losing everything. Mm-hmm. How do we understand these three words in the Medrash? That a Kaddish Baruch Hu said to Meshur Zainu, right now to Adam, have a right to live this. If someone wants to make a mistake, he'll make a mistake. This is just a mistake. This is his whole amount, his whole belief in the Bari Ayla. Dr. B'chanan, you have to understand the true meaning of these words by right to live this somebody wants to make a mistake, you can make a mistake. The Rabbani Shalom's answer to my Shavayinu is as follows. For Misa, there's no issue here at all. You can have hundreds of generations of these beautiful little Yiddish Kindalach that come into their classrooms with their pay is flowing and their tits is outside and their brand new Beresha Shalom is so proudly open in front of them and they're swaying back and forth and the Rebbe is sitting by the table holding a lolly in one hand and pointing with his finger with the other and they come to the Fasik Nasa Adam and HaKadosh Baruch Hu said Kum lo and their mensh let's make man and you're not going to have a, a whole slew of children saying what? Nasa Adam? just how many people made man anyway? and if you think I'm going a little bit too far over here in as living the scene this is really the words of Rebbe Khan let me quote it to you Many generations, 
Loingen hat neu gesagt, little children learn the cheder in their cheder, mit Tarek HaKomesh, from the Komesh, at the Pasig, Nasa Adam, they even have Shalom Betar. No one is walking out with less Amunah in a Kodesh Baruch Hu. All these children listen to their lesson in Pashat Bereshit, and they are walking out with more Amunah in a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Well, maybe children don't know Digduk. Maybe they don't know that Nasa means come, let us, that there is a committee over here. No, no, we're talking about children who learn Rashi, of Ocham explains. And Rashi makes it very clear. It's the way it is proper to do. And you know something? The Anish Milo died in the Fox of Khalila. It's a volcano to shine that there's a problem over here. That there's a suggestion, Hasr Shalom, that challenges the actus of the boy Riyayla. The Rabbi Hashem says, I'm telling you, no pure, innocent Nisham is going to open up a Chumash and learn this passage and walk away saying, uh, how do I understand it? But what will happen is, you will have people who are caught carrying Apikarza, or at least who are Pesach HaShpeh and are not sure. You're going to have Nebuch people that were exposed to alien influences. And their minds and hearts are corrupt. And even though the Amun in every Yiddish heart is there and cannot be tampered with, like Hibbit of and Biakov, the Orachim HaKadosh explains, as we mentioned earlier, the Pagam that cannot be erased doesn't exist by Klaisa. But Lamaisa, the Amun can be covered up. And these Meshamais Nebuch, these people that need help, that have been persuaded, away from the Rabbi Yisholoyim, they're going to come to this pasuk and they're going to say, uh-oh, Nasa Adam, what does this mean? It's plural. Nasa Adam is not the problem. They are the problem. And because they are the problem, says the Rabbi Yisholoyim, I am not going to rob Klau Yisrael of this important lesson, of this Yisraelistic lesson to me the Sterech Eretz. And that is, ask before you do. The Arotz Elitzis the one who's going to make the mistake. Yes, he's going to make the mistake anyhow. So the said of art, no one became an apikaris, no one went off the derech because of a kasha that he had. But people use kashas as a terrace for them to go off the derech. The Amos says, the Svar Magdashim explain that the Pesukim of Bereshis inject the moon into our hearts. When we read Bereshis, Simchus Tariya for the first time, and then Shabbat Bereshit. That is Mamshach and Amunah into our heart. There is an Ar Haganis. There is a light of Amunah that one day everybody will see clearly, clearer than any light in this world. And that Ar Haganis is hidden in the words of the prayer. I believe the Chavot Chaim suggests that from time to time a person should read again and again the Pasha of Bereshit, the Pasha of Bria Salah, because that is Mamshach, the Amunah, that there is one by the Allah. The much less sass of attached. Bereshit. Before you begin to think about any problem, before you begin to worry about anything, before you even begin to sit down and start planning what to do, the Esh Tazachir, before anything, understand that Baruch Akin of the Shemayim Hashem created the heaven and earth, and the world is not Hefka. There's a Hashgacha. There's a Hashgacha Pratis that governs, that dictates, that creates, that gives life to anything that exists. So do your best, try to work your way out of the problem, but don't panic. We know that the world is not a free for all. And nothing happens unless the Kaddish Baruch Hu allows it to happen. And every major event in the world, every minor event in the world, that is Nogeya to the Kral and that is Nogeya to the Prat, is all here in the blueprint. And as a matter of fact, it's all here in the words Bereshis. The rest of the Torah is a Pirish on the word Bereshis. The Vilna God said that all the Tariq Mitzvahs are Marumas in the word Bereshis. If you look in the Sefer Agad the Perkaf in the Bnei Yisafra, he lists over there literally hundreds of mitzvahs and minhagim that are all the rumors in the word Bereshit. Bereshit, if we can say, Lahavl is like a disc that contains within it the whole essence of the Bria, the codes of existence for the Bria. And the Amazir, reading the Pasha of Bereshit, infuses a Muna in the heart. The Chavot Chaim suggests that from time to time a person should read the Pasha of Bereshit. That's what gives us our Muna. These are the words that Hashem used to create the world. The Asar Mamoris Shenivra Ha'ilam. The Asar Mamoris corresponds to the Asar Tadibrais. This is the Bria. Taira is the blueprint for the Bria. And the key to the blueprint is in the word Bereshis. The Vilna Gaon explains that in Bereshis you have the key elements of Kiyam Hagos, 
of the physical existence of the person and the kiyom of the neshama. Bereshis, he said, is Rashi Tevais, the base is Bia, normal life, normal family life, Rechitza, washing, that's the Resh. The person can't live without cleansing himself. Achila, can't live without food, that's the Alf. Shasiya, you can't live without drinking, that's the Shin. Yeshiva, Yeshiva means physically sitting, resting a certain amount of Yeshiv Hadas, a place to dwell. And the tough and voracious is Tardema, being able to sleep. That is the kingdom of the world. These six things are necessary in order to exist as a human being. And by the same token, Bereshit also is the Rashi Tevis of the six things that the Neshama needs. The days is Bina, understanding, a deeper understanding. The Rashi is Ria, being able to see, being able to see, look me as, being able to see what you have to strive for, who you have to look up to. The Aleph is a Mila, the Kayach of Dibur in Torah and Tefillah and the Kiyah said Dibur and Shmir is Alashon. The Shin is Shmir, the ability to be able to listen, to hear. The Yud is Yishuf, a certain amount of Menuchas and Efesh, to be able to concentrate and absorb the words of Torah and Mitzvah. And the toughest Talmud, the ability to learn. There is a Pasuk in Tila. Ki Hashasis, Yehoreisun, Sadik Mapa. Pasuk Shad in the word Hashasis is foundation. However, the gross says Hashafes in Aramish means, or can be spelled Shtuf, which means a sixth. Ki Hashafes Yehoreisun is the foundations of the world. These six things, if the word Bereshus is destroyed, Tzadik Mapa, what can the Tzadik be piled? What can anyone accomplish with this Bria? The Bria would cease to exist. I don't want to go into it now, but there were stories where Rappi Carson came to the Vilna Garden, and they challenged him where where are our beliefs and the rumors in the word Bereshus and he showed them. He showed them. There's a cycle to this world that eventually allowed different things to rise to the surface at different times and ultimately it's all in a sign of Amunna. But mainly now we understand what Jabal is saying. The Torah in Bereshus is giving us the key elements to existence. And for an al one of those key elements is not to think that you're too smart but to ask advice and to seek counsel and to find a Moira Derech, to be able to help you with the difficulties in life, and to guide you and help you make decisions. And there is no more powerful way of impressing that than to illustrate that a Kaddish Baruch himself sat down with the Malachim and said, let us make man. But Moshe Rabbeinu said, I, the Apikoros, is going to come running and say, Aha! Nasa Adam! HaKadosh Baruch was not alone. He had help. So our answer to that is, no. Someone who is looking for a Munna is going to find it in the word Bereshus. Because this passion of Bereshus is the key to our Munna. It's the conduit of a Munna. This is what channels a Munna into our heart. And the key to a Munna is Hachna and Bittu. To be mavatli yourself that you're not smart. The smarter a person thinks he is, the more gaiva he has, the more nisgayinus he has in Amunna. The stipers says that. It says about a bal gaiva, ain't aniva hu yechayim lo adukecha. So therefore, not to write this, because people are going to have nisgayinus in Amunna, just the opposite. Those who have nisgayinus in Amunna are going to have it anyway, because they didn't learn Bereshus enough. And if you learn Bereshus properly, you're going to see in Nasa Adam a lesson of being miracle yourself, that no one is too smart, and that is going to fill your heart with Amunna. And if you learn it wrong, you're going to see happy courses. But if you don't learn Bereshit right, this person will be an Apikaris anyway, because this is the key to our Amunna. So there's no point in losing the lesson. There's nothing to lose. The loss would have been there anyway, and there's everything to gain. Every Pasuk in Bereshit is necessary to establish the foundation in our heart that there was one Boyre Oilam and there is one Boyre Oilam and there always will be one Boyre Oilam. The Strikhova once explained that the Aramaic translation for the word Bereshit is Barah. Bez Reshal. Barah can mean three things. Barah can mean a son. Barah is a son in a rash. Barah can also mean Brius, Gizunt. And Bez Reish, Bar, can also mean Tfua in Arash. It can also mean grain. So these are the three things 
that a person is misspelled for. Bonai, Chaye, or Mazayne. Children, life, and Parnas. But during difficult times, a Yid has to look at Pasha's Bereshis. That this is the instruction manual that I was created with. And although it seems that I have terrible hurdles ahead, that the whole world is falling into a whirlpool, and how am I going to exist, and what is going to be? So no. There is a plan to the world. It's all in the word Bereshit. And the choices that you need to exist, both in Gashmias and Ruchmias, are there. We may be surprised about events of the world, but the Rebbeinu Shalalim is not. It's all part of the plan. And what we need to survive has been prepared for us. This year is distributed by Kolodaf, 11 Stay Hemet Street, Yerushalayim. For donations, please call 02-538-3999. Fax 02-538-0267. Postbox 57035.